practice. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to UCA Houston's uh, webinar or Zoom meeting. Um, uh, how to talk to our next generation about racism. Um, so uh, you all have known that uh, recently uh, George Floyd's uh, case has really uh, generated a national outcry and protest everywhere, uh, including uh, in the U.S. and in other countries uh, against racism and also against police brutality um, of uh, African Americans. Uh, so uh, the student from Yale has, uh, have written this letter and um, uh, you probably have all seen it, which also caused uh, heated debates within our community. And also, uh, you know, the most um, interesting thing is the large generation gap between first generation um, Chinese parents and their children. So we want to host this meeting uh, to have the opportunity for parents and uh, for our, our children to talk about the issue. And uh, so we can uh, truly have a better understanding of this problem, uh, not only racism, but also, you know, where can we go from our generation gap from this point? And also the split, the, the division between the two sides of the community. Um, because as our community has uh, been so divided, then we don't have power. We cannot stand on our two feet. The two feet are fighting with each other. And that's the problem I see. Uh, my name is Helen Shi. Um, I, uh, uh, I am a UCA board member, also a representative of UCA Houston. Uh, this is where we're hosting this uh, Zoom meeting at this point. I want to welcome all of you to our meeting and thank you so much for spending the time with us tonight. Um, just a brief introduction of this uh, particular meeting. Uh, the purpose of the meeting is really, again, as I said, to bring everyone together uh, on this uh, topic, have a, a create a safe space for our experts to speak about their experiences and share their knowledge in this field, and also to have parents and children being able to talk to each other and resolve the problem. And also, we um, want to respect everyone's opinion, and so please be open-minded and respect of each other. And uh, let's now to um, you know have this respect of comment or argument during this Zoom session, and that's very important. Um, also, I want to uh, introduce briefly of our four panelists, including myself, and uh, I'm gonna adjust the sequence of the talk a little bit. And, and our first speaker is Mr. Raymond Chong, and he is actually a, um, uh, sixth generation, his, his children are uh, seventh generation actually living in the U.S. So their family came here 1849, uh, more than 150 years ago. And uh, they, have through, they have witnessed the change of this country and uh, have a tremendous amount of experiences, unique stories that they can share with us, how their family has lived through uh, this seven generations and witness the change of the society, especially how racism has uh, gone through in this whole period of time and how, for example, the civil rights movement in 1968 has completely shaped this country. And from that point on, because of the civil rights movement uh, initiated by the African American community and how uh, Asian American communities uh, work together and stand up together with African American community and has propelled social progress and equality that benefit all of us. Uh, unfortunately, many of us don't see that. So Ms. Raymond is going to share some uh, unique experiences from his family. Our next speaker is Dr. Jing Li. Uh, she is a sociologist 
from Rice University. Uh, her expertise actually is in racism. That's her scientific study. So she can share with us some uh, experience she has and also the teaching. She also teaches students. So let's hear from her on uh, how some of the uh, sociology terms are defined so she can uh, um, um, sort of help us to understand this problem better. Uh, and our third speaker is Dr. Stephen Pei. He is the uh, founder and also advisor for UCA. And he is a uh, professor from University of Houston. He teaches uh, electric engineering. And uh, he has uh, come to this country uh, in, uh, in 1970s. So uh, he actually personally witnessed the aftermath or the impact of civil rights movement and how Asian American community benefit from that movement and uh, how he was able to come to this country as a result of that, in fact, to pursue his graduate uh, study in the US. And uh, he will be sharing with us his personal stories when he first came to US and how uh, he has seen the society has moved on from that point on. And also as a parent, uh, he also has uh, ABC, the American born children grew up um, in this country and uh, uh, his children actually are an uh, adult now. So he will share some of his uh, interesting uh, stories, personal stories, and also perspective as parents. And I am the last speaker uh, of this panel and uh, I actually worked in holistic health and I'm interested in body, mind, spirit, and holistic education and the whole approach to raise children. And so I will tell uh, some of my uh, story as well. So uh, with that, uh, I'm gonna introduce our first speaker, uh, Mr. Raymond Chong. Uh, he will uh, start his slide as a, a, called a, a Chinese uh, American experience uh, in, in this country. Uh, thank you so much. I'll let um, Mr. Raymond speak. And this story is about us Chinese since the beginning in America. We've always been perceived as a threat, a yellow pearl, a perpetual foreigner. We were cartoonist figures. We were hated, despised, disdained by the white Americans in the very beginning since the Gold Rush and before that in the 1700s and 1800s. We had that image, we were a threat, we were the yellow terror, we were the threat to the European culture. We're called Chink, John Chinaman. The Chinese must go, having a Chinaman's chance in hell. These were the typical slangs, remarks about us Chinese at that time. The history is not taught fully in America about the Chinese experience. There were massacres in America. In 1871, in Los Angeles, 17 Chinese were hung, lynched. In 1885, 28 Chinese were killed at Rocky Springs, Wyoming. In 1887, in Snake River, in Devil's Canyon, Oregon, 31 miners, Chinese miners were slaughtered. So that's the context of what the Chinese had experienced. And then in 1882, Congress passed the first exclusive racial law against the Chinese called the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And that's because the white Americans were worried about the Chinese taking jobs away from the honest European white men. We cannot be citizens. We were only guest workers. There was a quota system of how many Chinese can come to America. And for the men, they could not bring their wives. They could not bring their children. It created a batch society. In California, Chinese men could not marry white women, they cannot own property. 
if you brought your family, your wife, your kids, your children were segregated in a Chinese only school. If you go to a hospital, you would go, only go to a Chinese ward. So that's how the Chinese were treated in the 19th century through the 20th century. My roots is in Guangdong, in Longgongli, in Kaiping, or Hoiping, in Guangdonghua. And what you see is my village. Roughly 200 people live in that village. It was founded in 1506 AD. Long time, 1506 AD. The first generation of my family, the first wave, the sojourners, was Chang Sheng Zheng. My great, great, great grandfather, the first generation, in 1849, coming from Hong Kong to San Francisco, the first city, the first port, to the second city, Sacramento, to mine for gold in the Central Valley in California. The second generation is my great, great grandfather, Bun Yun Chung, the second generation. And he was involved from 1865 to 1869 in the Transcontinental Railroad, the Iron Road, where the Iron Horses met on May 10th, 1869, 151 years ago, at Primary Point, Utah. And I was there last year on May 10th, 2019, when Connie Young spoke about her family history. Um, next, the third generation, my great great grandfather, Hong Long Chung, third generation. He came to America around 1892, lived through 1926. He was a, what do you call it, entrepreneur, a capitalist. He was successful as a in gambling and in opium. So he made good money. And he came back to the village as a gold mountain man, very wealthy and became the mayor of our village in 1926. Next, fourth generation, my grandfather, Moi Chung, fourth generation, the Imperial Restaurant in Cambridge. He, he arrived in America on the student visa in 1912 at Angel Island Station in San Francisco. Eventually, he owned the Imperial Restaurant specializing in Cantonese cuisine called chop suey. So this Imperial Restaurant in Cambridge was in Massachusetts. He had that restaurant from 1923 to 1936. A sad story, because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, it was difficult to bring your woman, your wife, your children, from 1923 to 1966, my grandmother and my grandfather were separated for 43 years. So that's a consequence of the racism in America. Next, my father, Jim Sui Chong, fifth generation, born in 1922, arrived on Gold Mountain in Boston, as a paper son, a paper son, he had a paper father. He was given what they call papers to pretend that he was a son of a legal citizen. And he came and arrived in America in 1932 in Boston, lived with my grandfather at Boston and Cambridge at the Imperial Restaurant. Eventually he was in World War II in, in, as, as a is an aircraft mechanic for the Navy, for Pan American World Airways at that time. Eventually, from 1946 to 1950, he owned the Kubicon Theater Restaurant, a nightclub, a Chinese nightclub, where he had good drinking, good food, a show, dancing, things of that nature. Next slide, me. I'm the sixth generation, Raymond Douglas Chong. And I'm a civil engineer, graduated from the University of Southern California, got a master's degree and so forth. And been involved in many things in, in, across the country. And, and I'm, a, I'm a historian, a poet, writer. 
I'm really into the Chinese American dream. But my story, I grew up at the time in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. The Chinese were the hated enemy. Red China, bear in mind, the Chinese Revolution, 1949, the Korean War, the Chinese Confession Program from 1956 to 1965, the Vietnam War. I, growing up, I thought I was a white American and I hated the Chinese. I hated listening to Cantonese talk. I dreaded seeing the elders because I was whitewashed as a Chinese American. And during that time, I remember 1965 in Los Angeles, there was the Watts riot where there was an uprising against the, the police brutality against the blacks. At that time, in 1965, they were known as Negroes, Negroes. And us Chinese at that time did not really get along with uh, the Africans, the Negroes, but we recognized we had a common cause with that. And that created the yellow power movement from the 68 and, and on. And that was uh, from, the, from Berkeley and in San Francisco at that time. From my experience as an American, I have experience we call indirect, indirect discrimination against what they call the bamboo ceiling or the mm. gas ceiling. There's always indirect reference. And I always, being who I am, I'm always doing the right thing, but they always, there's always a subtle in, um, a, 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 an attack or subtle remark for me being Chinese. And in all the meetings I attend in government, I'm the only Chinese. Every single meeting in government, city hall, at the Capitol, I'm always the single Chinese. But if I do see one, I'm always, brother, sister, how are you? So that's, that's how I feel about being Chinese American. And the fifth generation, my number one son, Kenny Kyle Chong, fifth generation, just graduated from UT Austin, go Longhorns, and he's the filmmaker. And I'm not your traditional dragon father, so I let him find his way in his career, his path, and he is going to be a filmmaker. So that's a nutshell of that. And for references, excellent reference for the Chinese American experience, Become an American, the Chinese American experience by Bell Moyer, 2003, a wonderful program. Then the Chinese Exclusion Act, that was another wonderful program on PBS. And then the more recent one, the Asian American on PBS, wonderful. I learned a lot myself, more about the Japanese experience, the Filipino experience and so forth. And the book is The Chinese in America by Iris Chang, the writer of the history of the massacre in Nanjing. So these are excellent references for you all to get educated, a little bit more familiar with that. So my journey, my family has been in America, seven generations, 170 years, so many stories, so many tales, gambling, opium, tragedy, struggle, sacrifice, but we all still believe in the American dream. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raymond, uh, for introducing your really very interesting. I, I would think you have a, should have a really unique experience how you generate uh, your different uh, generations experience racism, right? So, yes. uh, so uh, are, were you in America in 19, uh, 1968? That, that was the year for civil rights movement, the major uh, right in the country, right? Major <laughs> movement. Sort of like, just like now, what we're experiencing right now. Yes. Uh, so in sense, I really yeah. see that what we're going through is a new version of civil rights movement. So can you comment on, were, were you in that movement, what experience and, and how the, the civil rights movement really changed American history, especially for Asian Americans? Well, I was 12 years old in 1968 and I live in Los Angeles near Hollywood, City Hall. And there's the civil rights, there was the, 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 the love movement, there was the the, the, the Vietnam War movement. I remember the assassination of Martin Luther King. 
in, in spring of 2000, in, in 1968. But most relevant, I remember the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy in Los Angeles in June 1968. I remember that moment, that, that moment, that, the Wednesday morning when, when he got assassinated. And in my mind, 1968 was a, a year of turmoil. We had the riots at the Democratic Convention in, in Chicago. We had so much angst on who was running for president, whether it's Democrat or Republican. We had a lot of protests across the country. After the Martin Luther King got assassinated, there were riots on the East Coast and so forth, but not in Los Angeles. But there were many riots equivalent to what has happened more recently and, and in 1992 in Los Angeles. So um, to me, up until 2020, 1968 has been a pivotal year in my mind, always 1968, because of the Vietnam War, the civil rights movement, the generational change, things of that nature. Things were, were collapsing, diverge, converging at that point in 1968. So yes, yeah, so what I'm trying to say is, how does that change the racism? And you know, you know how America has changed from 1968, and how it's related today, you know, 2020. What changed in 1968 was the the, the Asian minorities, the the Chinese, the Japanese, the Filipinos, they realized they cannot do it on on small teams or culture. They have to combine resources, a common goal, a common plan and they broker deals with the age with the africans the hispanics to kind of blend their effort together and that was very effective in particular in 1968 at the san francisco state university that was a coming of the different races blacks brown and yellow that was before that chinese and japanese were doing their own thing but 68 created a opportunity to bond together with a common common dream. So do you think that what may happen or may help us uh, in the 2020 movement or how do you see that? I would say from my reflection it's echo same same angst same anger um, the difference is we got so much multimedia attention to that when I was a kid I remember was watching black and white TV, uh, newspaper, um, some radio. So, but now the difference is you have so much information, resources, fake news, fake stories, all that. There's so much information that we're all fully aware across the world, not just in America, about this particular situation with um, Floyd George in particular, um, and tragically. Uh, tragically but I see so much similarities, so much street protests. I see it everywhere. Um, it, it, okay. It's another pivotal year, 2020. Yeah, so it's really repeating. We're repeating the history of 1968. And a lot yeah. of us actually, a lot of us are born around that time, you know, and it's very interesting that we are coming to this middle age, you know, 50 years old, um, and then repeating that part of history and, uh, and just, uh, you know, um, seeing that how those changes coming back again it's very interesting thank you so much miss raymond and i hope uh, people have a chance to watch this asian american pbs series it's very enlightening i learned so much from that uh, series actually so um thank you so much raymond and i'd like to bring in our next panelist uh, dr jing lee and uh, uh, so i'll let her to speak about her experience and as a sociologist so this is her uh, field of expertise Go ahead, Jing. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, 谢谢, uh, 慧伦邀请我, 然后谢谢UCA, 这个forum. 我觉得很荣幸在今天在这里可以跟大家分享。我今天其实准备了一些slides. Um, uh, I, first, I, let, me, let me speak English first because I think there's still some people who only want to, uh, they prefer English, but I, I want to, uh, I want to uh, say to them, uh, maybe there are ABCs, maybe uh, I, I will not talk mostly in English, but I will talk English mixed with Chinese. Uh, the reason, um, there are different reasons. Okay. Um, 
one what one major reason is I think we don't talk in Chinese about this topic enough. 我们就基本上用中文讲这些很困难。Uh, that is one actually a diff a, a very uh uh important reason why we we don't talk about we. 我们基本上没有这样的工语言工具来进行一个很有效的沟沟通。所以，嗯、um, ，I will talk my slides in English mixed with Chinese because all the sociological terms I learned trained in. English, right? Uh, is actually, um, 讲中文用这个样子来讲中文对我来说是一个很大的挑战。我 actually 很少跟我的朋友有很有效的沟通这些，因为 for many reasons, 还还其中一个一个很大的原因就是，嗯，很多的词都没办法有一个很有效的解释跟交流。所以是为什么我想在 UCA 呃这个 forum 讲这件事情的原因。Uh, but I want to apologize for for the a few people who can only uh, understand English. Uh, maybe those are ABCs. You can later talk with your parents, especially when I talk my own experience. I like to talk in Chinese. Because I think Chinese, Chinese uh, okay, is the is is uh, is really I. Chinese is my favorite language. Okay, then I prefer to talk about my own experience using Chinese. I want to talk about this. This will make people listening to it more easily. Um, easier to understand. Um, then easier to have a connection. Okay, because I think many people in this area have the same experience as me. I compare to Raymond. I am a new immigrant. Uh, uh, I came after 2000. Okay, I came for my graduate study. Um, uh, 我的经验其实很蛮特别的，因为我知道没有很多嗯， um, 没有很多呃，中国人 study sociology。呃，我在我的学习过程中认识一些中国中国同学，很多人后来毕业以后也不再做这些了，他们转行做别的，然后。只有凤毛麟角还继续继续在做，呃，社会学，然后呢，更是凤毛麟角会想要研究，呃，移民，呃，像我研究的问题后，或者是，呃，跟种族有交叉的移民课题，所以，呃，我其实准备了一些 slides， 但是我我我想了一下，我我不想我不想教课 ，OK， 因为因为我我。你们也不是我的学生，然后我觉得我更想从我的个人经验来讨论一下这个我对这些东西的理解，也许我觉得会更有帮助。然后后面我还是会，呃，会会讲一下我的我 ，the sociological terms about 这这些，呃，偏见啦，嗯，歧视啦，种族歧视这些各种不同的，呃，语语言。OK。呃，是这样的 ，OK， 我记得呢，呃，我我，呃，很很很清楚，我我我我从小到大其实从来没有跟我的父母讨论过社会问题，呃，我觉得是不是很多人都跟我有类似的经历，所以呢，我呃，我一直到很呃，我觉得 teenager， 呃呃，或者是更大的时候，我才有机会和 anybody， 呃，讨讨论，嗯，讨论社会问题。呃，那是在中国的时候，我记得很清楚。呃，我第一次讨论这个问题的是，是和和和我的历史老师，呃，高中的历史老师。因为我比较特别一点，是我非常喜欢历史，啊、呃，然后我是历史课代表，呃，然后我跟他讨论的一些问题七七八八的，他其实我很感激的就是一点，就是他从来不给我答案，有一些我问的很困难的问题，他没办法回答。其实，但是呢，他会告诉我这是很好的问题，所以呢，就嗯、呃，让我产生了一些。呃呃，很多呃思考，所以这个思考呢，一直嗯，就是就是在 move on， 一直到我这这就一直直到我呃从大学，然后最后我决定到美国来学社会学是很大的原因。然后，但是我到美国学社会学以后呢，呃，其实我一开始对对这个呃美国社会学并不是完全的懂，因为我当时在我在大学里时时候是学经济学。因为我大三、大四的时候修了一些社会学的课，所以我很喜欢社会学
，最后我决定是来社会学。虽然我也拿了经济学的 offer， 然后最后还决定我拿都拿到了，但是我还决定学来学社会学。但是我开始学社会学的时候，我并不懂，呃，种族问题，我完全不懂，因为中国没有这个问题，基本上，嗯、呃。呃，然后我又是汉族人，然后我又生长在长江中下游平原，我 no reason 我我我我 understand， 所以呢，嗯，我也没有兴趣，说我很冷淡，就是对对这个 topic， 一直我就是这种这种这种，嗯，我很喜欢一些呃别的课题，我喜欢比如说移民课题，我喜欢人口学这课题，但是、嗯、我没有很感兴趣呃种族话题。呃，很多的我的中国的同学都是这样认为，因为呢，嗯嗯，我有个师兄，我记得很清楚的跟我说过，他说在美国社会学，呃，是一个很 liberal 的学科，是个很开放的学科，但是呢，呃，这个 race 就是玄学，就是永远研究不完的一个这么一个话题，我并不是很懂。然后呢，这就这种状态，我一直到我一直到硕士毕业，然后呢，在我读博士的时候。嗯，我我一开始还是这样的 ，OK。然后一直到我的博士，大概第二年还是第三年的时候，发生了一件事情，嗯，让我非常非常的呃 ，shocked。嗯，我大家都知道，社会学系是一个很很很很很 liberal 的学科。如果你不知道的话，就是所有的研究是呃 race race 种族问题，基本上都是从社会学系出来的，最主要的东西。呃，但是呢，就在我就在这么一个最 liberal 的这个系里面，我受到了我们我当时系里的一位白人女教授的歧视。OK， 我会讲后面我会讲到歧视，其实不光是他对我说了一些不好的话，或者是呃对我进行嗯、呃、不有不好的态度，他有 action。OK， 所以我成了一个受害者。呃，我。同时受到歧视的呢，还有我的，嗯、呃，韩国男同学，还有一位是，呃，同性恋男同学。OK， 呃呃，这件事情对我很影响很大。我当时呃去了嗯、呃、研究生院 o m b u d s m a n person office， 呃呃 ，dean of graduate students， 呃 ，dean of social science， 呃 ，offices， 哎哦呃，就是我等于是上访了。OK。呃，最后，嗯，不是，呃，很有用，但是呢，也帮了我。这件事情对我的影响非常大，还有就是精神上很大的一个，呃，冲击。所以从那以后，基本上我与我我的价值观进有进行改变，因为我非常抑郁，抑郁很久，我几乎要放弃我的学位。我当时我能去学校进行各种走访，就是因为我已经决定要放弃我的学位了，我不想再学了。如果这件事情不能够，然后。如果对我进行有有这么大的影响，我已经不想再读我的社会学博士了。因 It's not gonna be worth it。我愿意放弃所有我我我可以有的。我 No, I'm not gonna do this。OK， 就是这么一个故事。嗯、呃，后来我恶补了一通，我<笑>学的东西。最后，嗯、呃，就最后 I come to turn with with this what happened to me。Luckily， 我我继续继续了我的我的学学业，然后。最后，我还继续留在这个 field 里面，然后做一些与此相关的话题。Anyway， 呃、uh, ，talking all of this， 因为我是想要 offer 一些社会学的一些 perspective。因为有的时候常常听到在在很多朋友或者是在微信群里面，大家会讨论什么是歧视，说中国人写歧视，写歧视呀，在做中国的时候歧视乡下人，对不对？然后上海人歧视，嗯，苏北人 ，whatever。然后呢，也会就会很多这种讲法。我我我主要就是讲了这么多我的以前的呃经验，其实就是想要跟大家分享一下，最我们到底是在讲什么？当我们讨论歧视的时候，我来 share 一下我的 slide。OK， 就是 OK， I'm sharing already。OK， 所以呢，呃，我的这个 slide 就是在基基本上就想要。告诉大家这些区别吧。从我的呃社会学的角度来讲，基本上有这这么几个常见的呃 term， 就是刻板印象、偏见、歧视和种族歧视 （stereotype, prejudice, discrimination 和 racism）。呃 ，stereotypes 就是基本上是 OK，OK、okay, 
oversimplified generalizations about groups of people. 就是你你基本上就是一个 statement， 就是你你讲一个人是怎么样的，一群人是怎么样的，他就是这样的，就是因为我对我觉得他们就会这样。这可以是关于 race, ethnicity, age, gender, as sexual orientation, any category. 那可以是好的，也可以是不好的。呃，对于对于 racial 的 stereotypes， 很多时候即使既然即使是好的，也可能会有一些很好的。很不好的影响。这里我会讲到，嗯、呃、嗯、呃，比如说 model minority, perpetual foreigners, yellow peril, especially model minority， 它它是一个，就是等于说，很多人都觉得它是一个，呃，积极的一个这么一个刻板印象。OK， 呃，你是如果你是 model minority 的话，你你你你 work hard。呃，对不对？很，你很勤奋，然后呢，你你不抱怨，你不接受政府的 hand out， 你你你你不要求，你就是很很刻苦这样子，你就是工作很勤奋。但是 model minority 的另外一面也是你从来不 complain， 然后呢，你不 complain， 然后你你你你不 rock the boat， 就是说你不会，呃，你不会抗议，就算有不公平的时候，你可能也忍了，就是这么回事吧。然后 model minority 其实是对，是是是。是我们大家都都很多人，呃，就是 benefit and suffer from this stereotype at the same time. So, well, had had many of stereotypes about black people, violent, stupid, lazy, and white people, for example, don't know how to dance. These are stereotypes. Stereotypes just ideas. But the prejudice, the part, is different. It's not prejudice. It's not just ideas. And there are feelings and attitudes. Okay, that is. It's very similar to that stereotype. 就是说，你可能根本都没有这些，呃，你可能都你可能根本都没有这些，呃，经验。但是呢，你会你会说这些是这些特征是这群人特有的。那 It's not necessarily about uh race. 你可以可以是 anything. 可以是 age. 也可以是，呃，比如说，中国中国人说乡下人会怎么样？呃，或或者是呃，上海人或说苏北人会怎么样？我只是一个简单的例子，也可以，那个可以是 prejudice。嗯、um, ，more more examples are Mexicans are illegals， 并不是所有的都是。A lot of them live there, live here for many years. Asians have no leadership。这个是 very common prejudice。如果别人认认定你没有 leadership， 他们就不会给你这个环境，然后就就发怒了。你没有 leadership opportunities， you will not have leadership experience。什么是 discrimination？ 就是歧视了。discrimination 就是有 actions。你可呃，它包它它包括嗯、um, 很多事就是就是会有行为。OK， 它是 based on stereotypes 和 prejudice， 但是呢，它还有 actions， 它是有动作的，有行为的。OK， 所以我的那个白人女中生，她对我不光是只是对我对我蔑视或者是怎样，她还是她有 actions。OK， 嗯、um,。然后 legally 这是一个 legal term. Actually, a lot of times it refers to some protective, protective categories, such race, gender, age, religion, health, country of origins, and all that. I think there are probably eight categories. So there are, there are race-based laws against discrimination to to correct these problems. I won't go into detail. Then discrimination. I want to emphasize a point is that it 还有 actions， 而且呢 ，discrimination 是有你有 power， 基本上才会有 discrimination。当当然了，还有一些小的 interpersonal discrimination， 但是 discrimination 是 closely linked with power， 这是非常重要强调一点。那 racism 是更更加严重的一种，它包括呃 prejudice， 这个就是 ideas， 比如说 white supremacy。它基本上 justify the belief that one racial category is somehow superior or inferior to others. 就是 white supremacy 就是就是认为说 ，OK， 无论你你有多优秀，优秀个人，然后但是呢 ，as a race group, you are you are considered lower, inferior to uh the white if you are non-white. 基本上，那那那就是那就是 idea, right? 但是呢。Racism 更重要一点是它有 practices， 它有 both。OK， 它两个都有，就是既有 practice 也有 ideas。它根据社会学的讲法来说 
racism 只有可能发生在 majority 对 minority 身上，因为很多年的嗯、um, institutional 和 systematic racism， 嗯、呃、存在，白人可以被歧视，没问题，呃，可能的，呃，但是呢 ，racism actually so far 从 sociology understanding 它只有可能发生在。呃、uh, ，racial minority 的身上，因为这个是是一个大的一个概念，就是说，呃，他不是讲说 ，OK， 比如说我说某一个人就是坏，某一个白人他就是坏，或者是怎样，呃，它是一个大的社会社会角度上的一个概念，从比如说立法角度、教育角度，还有呃 ，criminal justice employment and racial profiling， for example， 呃 ，black men as criminals。但是呢，他们并不是唯一的。对，对，在中国人，嗯、呃，比较特别多的就是，也许，嗯、呃，可以讲到 racial profiling 的，就是，呃，华人科学家被 racial profiling as spies， 就是，就是，就是，嗯、呃、，that's all。哦，我有一些推荐的书，这些都是，嗯、呃，社会学社会学家写的大众读物的书，还，嗯，我觉得有兴趣家长，尤其是可以读一下第一本。第二本也是很好的书，但第一本，如果很多家长对于这个嗯 ，Asian American 的教育感兴趣的话，这里面讲了很多关于教育的东西，嗯呃,呃，我觉得会很有帮助。啊，就这样子，我想我的时间是不是已经过了 ？OK， thank you so much, Jane. So actually, maybe a lot of parents don't understand this concept called a model minority. So 我们中文应该怎么翻译 model minority？ 是叫模范少数民族少数族裔。Okay, so uh, yes, since we're kind of running out of time, uh, maybe uh, you all can Google this term called model minority, right? And so uh, do an internet search and see what kind of uh, things coming up about model minority and what actually, how that impact the Asian Americans, 尤其是对我们亚裔，其实这个 model minority 就像刚才这个李金博士讲，实际上是对我们亚裔的一种刻板印象，实际上它是限制了我们的发展。Uh, so if anyone can uh, bring the stories later on for future sessions, we can talk more about that. So Jing, we're going to move to our third speaker, Dr. Stephen Pei, Bai uh, Xiansheng uh, Dr. Stephen Pei is the founder and also advisor for UCA, and he will bring his unique stories and how he sees reason, and especially how he talks to uh, his uh, children, right, as, as parent, what, what parenting advice he can give, give to us. Uh, so Dr. Pei, if you can bring out your slide. Okay, I'm going to talk more about my personal experience. So therefore, I will use Chinese. I hope you don't mind. Uh, some people may not be able to understand Chinese. If you can uh, mix at least a little bit between the two. <laughs> Well, I, my slides are in English, so I hope they can understand that, okay? Uh, well, I ran out of time, so I don't have time to repeat in, in bilingual. Um, 我来美国读书的时候,我想跟很多来这边读书留学生一样,基本上对美国的社会并不太了解,其实也不太关心说实在话。来的话以后就是忙着读书。读完书以后开始工作那时候在我这行里面轮到贝尔实验室去工作是梦寐以求的工作所以当时的话非常开心的一头就栽到实验室里面去做科研几年过去了就像一个小男孩进那个糖果室一样的开心的很一九八二年是
，以今天你们听起来可能没有办法想象。就像刚才 Raymond 所讲的，从一九六八年开始，之后没几年我就来了美国。华人是有一定程度的进步。我们在贝尔实实验室里面就成立这个 Four A。Four A 是什么东西？就是 Asian American for Affirmative Action。可是那时候我实在是并不是太关心，我并没有在一开头就参与。成果人事件完完全全的改变了我跟当时很多人对事情的看法。成果人事件里面给我印象很深刻的有两个人，我不知道你们能不能看到我这个 share screen， 有没有？看不到。No. 看不到啊 ！We only see a black screen. You only see a black screen? Uh huh. Yeah, we only see a black, a blank, a black screen. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. it's come out. It's coming out. Yeah, no, it takes time. Yeah. 那时候给我印象很深刻是两个人，因为最近的话，大家在谈起 George Floyd 的事情，很多人就问一个问题 ：George Floyd 根本就不是个英雄，我们为什么把他？啊、呃，说的那么大一件事儿，同样的话 ，Winston c h i n 也只是个牺牲者，他也不是什么英雄。可是这两个人，他们死的时候，都变成一个当时的民权运动的一个象征。他们并不是英英雄，可是他们是个象征。可是真正给我印象深刻的是这两个人。华人那时候根本没有什么声音，没有什么影响力，不像今天稍微好一点。要不然的话，也不会造成这两个白人只是被罚了三千块钱美金就可以一天劳碌不错。当时黑人站出来了 ，Jesse Jackson， 他站出来，那时候不是那时候黑人团体出来支持那个压抑的话，我想我们的声音更微弱。另外一个很了不起的人就是温森清的母亲，就是右下角这位老夫人，一个那么柔弱的老老夫人，她很勇敢的站了起来，变成了当时整个亚裔民权运动的一个象征。我想这是一个不得了的转变，在当时。所以这个的话是 PBS 的那个 Asian American 的。特别的 series 现在还在网上，我现在就在网上拿下来，您是给大家看的。如果还有人没有看过的话，我极力主张他们看。那个这样的话，就是说，我们就换另外一个话题。一九八二年发生在我们家的另外一件事情，是我们有第一个小孩。三十八年过去以后，这是十二月底，不，五月三十号，我发给我女儿的信。这个、题目就是我电脑的题目，就是说 PBS series， 我就问他，你看过没有？我知道他们没有看，他们知道这回事因为我们的女儿在从小学到中学到大学，这方面她都非常非常的啊、呃、关心的人。可是他没有看。我其实要跟他讲的是后面这一半，因为我们在二十二号的话会在这边宣布颁第一届的 Lily 跟 Winston c h i n 的这个奖。我们得到了 Helen Helen Zia 的授权，会在 Houston 正式颁这个奖。领奖的人就是 Milan 黑块的那个两个勇士。可是我跟他提以后，你看他的回反应就蛮有趣的。他说：“爸爸，我的确打算去看。啊、呃，那个他非常有兴趣，并且他觉得他这个的话，他们是可以帮助他们了解的根。这个回答是我们所听过的标准的好女儿的回答。下一半就不对了。我完全同意。”跟我们的根连上是非常重要的。可是现在在今天这个时刻，我不觉得
能够很舒畅的谈亚裔美国人的问题，而不谈这个事情跟黑人目前运动的关系。结果他反反过来问我，他说，在这个时候。他非常好奇，他想要知道我对这个黑人运动目前是什么看法的。我想，很多父母都没有准备好要回答这个问题。我不知道大家感觉怎么样。所以，我就稍微讲一下我们这个女儿的背景。我们小时候，我在贝尔实验室工作的时候，我们在 New Jersey， 我们那小镇里面基本上一个白人的社会，三分之一的父母是在贝尔实验室工作，三分之一在 AT&T， 三分之一是 commute 到 Manhattan 上班。当时小孩还小，有些摩擦，你说是歧视嘛，谈不上，可是小孩子很敏感的，他们有点感觉，觉得不太对。我们到了 Houston 以后，我们女儿后来上学的时候，他们可以到 l a n i e r 可是我们选择不要到这种那么高级的学校去，我们就在我们家旁边的 Johnston。有一年过新年，他就问我们说：“过旧历年了，这个。” Irish 都可以穿绿衣服，我为什么不可以穿红衣服？因为我们刚刚说刚好买了一件红色的缝缝的龙在在刺绣在上面的一件红衣服给他，他很想穿，在过年的时候穿到学校去。可是红色不是他学校 color code。长话短说，他后来跟校长争执了半天，最后他那天是在学校大撒红包。红包里面，里面就是一块钱，他连他老师都给了红包。结果之后的第一个旧历新年，校长从麦克风上面宣布，今天是黄历报几千几百年，我都不知道那那是几千几百年。那个校长居然在麦克风上面宣布这件事情。吕岩后来在，吕岩后来在那个。女儿后来在 Google 工作，她关心的不是华人的民权，她关心是女人的平权。她是把这个女人的平权运动从 Google 带到 Facebook 去的人，所以长话短说，基本上这是我给她回答。我说今年二十二号我们会。在 s h o s t o n r e c o g n i z e 在 s e n s e Club 这个黑块里面，这两个英雄，一个是蜥蜴，一个是白人。他们所研究这个家庭也不是华人家庭，是个缅甸家庭。尤其是这个白人，他是冒了他自己生命的危险，赤手空拳的把这个凶手的刀给抢了下来。所以二十二号晚上七点钟，我们会有另外一个 panel discussion。这个 panel discussion 里面有哪些 panelist 呢？那当然，那个我们会有这个 Helen Zia， 因为他是授权我们用温森庆的名字来颁这个奖，给这两位英雄。所以英雄之一，这个白人。他会参加。另外一个人是 Annie Tan， Annie Tan 是温森庆的侄女，现在在纽约，是个中学老师。Reagan 是一个白人，他根本不认识这家缅甸人，结果事后他自己出来捐了两万块钱美金，就是说在网上替他捐，骗着缅甸人家捐了两万块美金。然后另外这两个了。Mark Tobin， 你们猜是他是什么主义的？你们很多人可能猜，照我这样说一下，这个人一定是黑人。对不起，他不是黑人，他是犹太人。他的犹太人组织 ADL， 
，他们在五月七号在 San t o n i 的市议会上面推动了一个法案 ，COVID-19 反仇恨的法案。另外一个人呢，这个呢是位黑律师，没有错。他为什么重要呢？他四月二十九号在 Houston Chronicle 上面写了一封投诉，发表了一篇文章。我们怎么看搬？我们怎么样看可以帮帮助停止这个反亚裔的浪潮？所以，在这个关键时代，我们再度的回到了三十八年前，中国人那时候，那时候在仇恨日本人，先是仇恨华人。作为少数民族，我想我们只靠我们的力量。没有办法抗拒这个大局面，我们必须要跟所有其他主义合作。谢谢。Thank you so much, Dr. Pei. I know there are a lot of story that you can share with us. Unfortunately, we only have ten minutes. So, are you saying that Chen Guoren, which is that Vincent Chen, is this the same person, right? Is this the English name and Chinese name? Also, and so that's the eighteen. Oh, sorry, nineteen eighty-two story. Okay. So I hope、uh, if people have chance to watch PBS series, there's a story featuring that. And、uh, again, if you're not sure about this, just always Google and do an internet search, and it will tell you a lot more about that part of history and how it actually changed Asian Americans' fate from that point on. And for anyone who don't、uh, know who is、uh, Helen Jia,、uh, uh, Helen Jia is a famous American journalist and author. She wrote、uh, quite a few books. Her most recent book is called "Last Boat Out of Shanghai." From Shanghai, the last boat out of Shanghai. I had an opportunity to meet with Helen Jia a couple of times in UCS meeting and also in Houston. So hopefully, we can see her again if you join us on June twenty second. She has so much to say about Asian American history, and she's such an instrumental person in our history. So make sure you Google Helen Jia also to learn about her. So I am the last speaker.、Um, To talk about、um, my experience, as、uh, my talk is called "A Chinese Mom for American Children,"、um, so、um, I hope、uh, you enjoy this part.、Uh, unlike the previous talk, I want this to be a very experiential、uh, learning for you.、Uh, so、uh, I will use this part of my talk to let you know a little bit more about yourself and racism. And all of other things we think、uh, we hold to be true in our mind. So I will start from a self introduction, but this self introduction is also an observation experiment. To observe what, I like you to observe and see how your mind cast a certain impression or certain judgment based on each sentence I will say. So just let's do this experiment together, and it will be really fun for you to learn a little bit more about yourself and about everyone else. I hope I can speak in English、uh, because the Chinese is there too. My first introduction is: I grew up in Beijing, China. 我是北京人 So when I speak this sentence, I like you to see what kind of feelings, thoughts, beliefs. Imageries, memories, people you associate with Beijing, or what do you know about Beijing? About, ah, so I say I am from Beijing. When I say I am from Beijing, I like you to feel the feelings, thoughts, memories, images, and the relationship between Beijing and Beijing. Ah, the relationship and the relationship between Beijing and Beijing. 有的人可能对北京是一种很好的感觉，那有的人对北京的感觉可能是不好的感觉，或者是你有的认识当中的北京人会是怎样子的感觉 ？So I like you to feel what you think what Beijing is about. People from Beijing, okay? And normally we'll do this experiment in a、um, in a one hour session because I would like you to write down how you feel. What kind of thoughts coming out of your mind? But today I only have ten minutes, and we're running out of time, so we're going to do this really fast. The next introduction is: I graduated from Tsinghua University. 我是清华毕业的
，而且我是个清华女，清华理工女，我是真正的清华理工女 ，because I studied electrical engineering and computer science。啊、uh, ，那我是学电机工程和和计算机的，所以我是真正的清华女理工女。那我在说这句话的时候，也是请大家 repeat。You repeat this experiment of what kind of feeling, thoughts, impression, memory, and kind of you know how do you feel about 清华理工女 ？What kind of general feeling you you feel about about this group of people? And so I'm going to move to the next. I studied biomedical science for my graduate degree, and I also have a PhD. Ah, I studied biomedical science, and I also have a PhD. So whenever I say this biomedical science, again, I like you to bring out all of your feelings, and memories, and kind of people you associate with. You know, people study this field, and how do you feel about that? And some people say I'm not good with biology, or I'm really good with biology, or I have a PhD too. Oh no, I only have master. Oh no, I'm not good for PhD. Oh, I I think I should really have a PhD. Oh, I think my children should really get a PhD. Oh, I don't think my kids are good with PhD at all. Whatever those thinking you have, and you can try to feel about them, and just let them bubbling up, sort of float up in your thoughts and in your mind. And my next one is my husband is an Indian. He grew up in South India. Ah, 我们这个这个这个这个题目可能会 very strong because I really want you to feel how you feel about Indian. 那我先生是印度人，并且他是在印度南方长大的。So again, sort of bring out all of your feelings and how you feel about Indians, and especially about South. 南方人呢？南方人，我 in China we have such strong feeling, you know, how 南方人 supposed to be, how 北方人 supposed to be, how 上海人 supposed to be, how 广东人 supposed to be, how 东北人 supposed to be. So we have all of these feelings, you know, all of the memory, and they are all floating out. So、uh, I always hear this discussion about Indians, Chinese, Chinese Indians, Indo Indian, Indo Indian, to such a degree that. When we're young, I'm sorry. When my daughters were young, my husband and I always got into an argument. No, you should learn English. No, you should learn Chinese. Oh no, you should learn Tamil. This is the state my husband from. He's from Tamil Nadu. His Tamil Nadu is truly the cradle of Indian culture. So he's very proud of it, his Indian culture, Indian heritage. So we fight all the time. And then my daughter said, "No, I'm not a Chinese. I'm not the Indian, but I'm American." So. This is how my daughters and now they they didn't learn Chinese, they didn't learn Indian, but they they want to be American. So that's a very interesting thing. So I'd like you to feel how India is impressed, impressing on your thoughts and your mind, and then your feeling about that. Ah, 当然印度人还皮肤比较黑，所以呢，那我们中国人对黑皮肤也有不同的想法。So this is how the East Asian feel about darker skin. You know. Does lighter skin means more pretty, or darker skin means bad or ugly? So I hear this conversation all the time about skin color and how that impresses on us. And this is part of the reason why we have white supremacy. You know, we think skin, you know, means you know lighter skin means better, right?、Uh, my last sentence is: We live in Houston, Texas. 我们住在德州休斯顿。So when you bring out this feeling about Houston, you know you may have certain friends or certain thing you associate with Houston, or even Texas. You know we live in the U.S., so each state has certain feelings or certain belief we have. You know East Coast, West Coast, Texas. Okay, the South down redneck. You know whatever you feel about Texas, those are all coming out. So I just like you to, to have all of this bubbling out. And put them together like a soup, sour and sweet, oh, you know, sour spice soup, whatever. So, so I put all of this together, and this question is who I am. 我是北京人。我从清华毕业，我有生物医学的博士。我我先生来自印度，我住在休斯顿。I can list more and more under that my polit political inclination, my religion, um. 
whatever I do, right? So all of this, we can put them together. I show you on the graph on the right side. So each bubble is how you associate one particular uh, group and that people do or, or, you know, what they can have. And so essentially in your mind, if you notice that, you kind of construct who I am based on all of those things I've shared with you and I become a person, leave that a box you have. So such a box can come from race or ethnicity um, and could also come from where people come from, such as Shanghai Ren, Beijing Ren, Guangdong Ren, Zhu Yi, the Dangshi Bai Ren, He Ren, or the Indo Ren, or the Pakistan Ren, whatever you know they come from. The other common thing we cast upon is economic status, uh, so because we tend to associate, you know, rich people to be better people, right? We like to be rich. And uh, also social status, you know, we tend to like those people in power. Um, if we have a person from rural areas or a homeless person, right, then we probably sort of don't like that. And at least we're not going to respect the homeless person probably as much as, you know, U.S. president or whatever, right? But what happened if U.S. president tomorrow become a homeless person on the street? It's exactly the same person, but how will we treat that person differently? Just because, you know, that person's social status changed, right? So that's something I'd like you to think about. Another common, uh, you know, cast impression is our, our job, our career, our profession, right? We like to be associate ourselves with people who are successful in our career. And uh, we don't like those people who don't have jobs, the jobless person, all right? A person may lose their job tomorrow. How do we see that person? We may lose our job tomorrow, become unemployed. And does that really change us in any way? And other uh, impression include uh, political affiliation. Right now we have a lot, of, a lot of argument between left and right, you know, Democrats and Republican. So just because a person says he's a Democrat or, or he's a Republican, how would they, we think about that person, right? And religious belief is another common thing we use to sort of frame people or box them up. You know, that this person's really a Christian, that person's a Buddhist, another person's an atheist, or how would they, we may think about that person. And there are so many other social affiliation we attribute people to. So eventually we put that person into a box that we construct. And so based on what I have introduced myself, uh, all of these things I have introduced yourself. You kind of already framed me how I'm going to be behave myself, right? Now, the other interesting thing is once you set up the frame, then I become a person living that frame for you. So I no longer have the freedom of how I'm supposed to behave because whatever I cast here, your mind will automatically reject those information that does not belong to that box. In a sense, if I behave in a way that does not hold true in your framed box, then uh, your, your mind, this is known in neurological science that you would reject me. And unless the difference is, if you're truly surrounded by people like me, and then you may start to gradually, your mind will start to remodel yourself and set up a new belief or new information structures, how the group of people like me tend to behave. And so then your model, sort of like this perception model, the model we talked about is called model minority, right? So the model will continue to sort of morph yourself and the degree of change really depends on people's mind. Some people are more open-minded, so they can continue to update their model. Some people you hear that they tend to be very stubborn and they always defend themselves. They don't want to change. They like to have a very fixed, very firm structure that they feel comfortable to live in that. And if you give them too much information or ask them to change and they will come out very fiercely to defend themselves. They would rather to kill that model or do anything very aggressive in order to defend the existing structure in their mind. And that's what when we call 
that people become very stubborn, you know, become really defensive. And those type of people can easily fall into a cult. I like you to Google this term called cult, 就是在中文里面叫邪教, and see what kind of psychological profile to make people prone to fall into a cult, to become a sort of a victim of the cult. And that's something that's very interesting to study. So the next question naturally we're going to ask is, what kind of bias filter does my mind have? And where do they come from? And I remember at one point, my daughter accused me as a racist. Mom, you're a racist. I said, oh, really? I said, I really love black, uh, you know, I really love African-American culture. I really love Latino culture. In fact, I really enjoy so many different cultures that we don't have in China. In the U.S., we can interact with all kinds of people. And I really enjoy that. I said, how can you call me a racist? You know, I got really surprised. And then I realized that I started to really observe myself and how I speak and how I think. Right, because I realized one time, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, kids in school they go to competitions and X Y Z, and 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 Asian Americans tend to be really excel, you know, really excel in STEM, right? So one time I, I remember that the kids are going to some some science competition or something, and then uh, there were two African American uh, students in that, and the rest are all Asian American children, and the, the two African American are there, and I made a comment. I said, oh. Where do these two African American students come from? You know, why why they're here? Is they're sort of out of place? And my, my daughter really, really, you know, criticized me after that. And, and they said, "Mom, you're really racist." And I said, "Oh yeah, you know." And I suddenly realized it just came out unconsciously. And I realized, oh, you know, I already have the stereotype in my mind that somehow the black, you know, the African Americans are not supposed to be good in STEM, and why they're here, right? So from that point on, I realized I really have to observe my mind. You know, what kind of bias I have hold true in my mind and where do they really come from? And if we understand that, then we can ask the question that do we really need to keep all of those bias and those impressions? What impressions are helpful? What impressions we probably should throw away that we, we really need to pay attention? We don't want to keep them because they're not helpful when we live in a culture in a country like America with so many different diversity around, right? And also when you hold such a strong stereotype in your mind, it also causes trouble that how you live and deal with other people. For example, if I have a very strong uh, belief or uh, view against certain group of people, right? If I have to work with those group of people, this really doesn't help me at all, right? So we really have to look deeper in our mind that what we want to keep and we want what we really want to throw away. So I'm going to finish my talk by giving a very specific advice, or I wouldn't say advice, uh, something I did myself, right? And um, since we're coming back to the original topic, how we communicate with our, with our second generation and to bridge that generation gap. And the reason is we grew up in China, we came to this country, and a lot of things we really don't know about America. And in fact, the more I live here, and the more I learn, I realize I really don't know anything about America. And, um, and our children grew up in this country, so they, their view and their perception box will be extremely different from ours. And that this is part of the reason why we have the generation gap and why we have trouble to talk to our kids. So the first step I would, you know, uh, um, what, what I did is really to look at what the children have learned in their school. A lot of Chinese parents are really interested in STEM, but my daughter grew up, uh, they re enjoy reading novels and fictions. They're extremely good with history and so they're very different, uh, you know, Asian American children. And, and I really enjoy reading with them to see how they study sociology, you know, social science. Social science is very important. Um, class, uh, but unfortunately not many parents pay attention. I always enjoy learning with them because they taught me so much. And so look at the recommended book readings in middle school and high school and, and, and ask your kids, you know, uh, if I want to learn about racism or a certain social problem in America, can you recommend me what book I need to read? And so I truly see my children to be my teachers, and I always ask them questions and to ask them to help me. And they're also, 
other bestseller books that you can look at, but those are going much deeper uh, for any parents who are really interested to know uh, a lot more sort of in-depth understanding what America is about and how racism really impacted society. I highly recommend you go through New York Times and Amazon or Barnes Noble, all of those bestseller books, because those are the books that people are reading at this moment. The new Jim Crow, uh, if you're not sure what does Jim Crow mean, again, Google and internet search and understand what that term means. It, it means a lot in American history. So Jim Crow, that's a keyword. And the, another bestseller just coming out, floating out uh, this couple of weeks is why uh, are all the black kids uh, sitting together? That's an excellent book to read about. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm putting a few books here for you to, uh, to learn a bit more. A bias is not a good book as well. We just just uh, just the experiment we have done, and uh, another good website for you to read about parent and children relationship is um, psychological. Uh, sorry, Psychology Today. There's a one particular article I did a lot of search to see what you can read about. It's called Attachment Detachment Parenting of Adolescents. Um, because we are this child 十几岁的这个青春期过度的时候他们要变成独立的大人他们不可能继续我们所有大人的思想 uh, This is like we, uh, we how we see our parents you know we cannot continue our parents thought and it's the same thing with our children they need to develop their own independent thinking and their own independent life so I hope those resources are beneficial for you to read and learn even more and um, uh, I also want to announce that uh, in addition to June 22nd event Dr. Pei has just mentioned about, we're also having a UC student scholarship on racial justice. Uh, this scholarship is going to be awarded to middle school, high school student and college student who will be willing to spend uh, two months on whatever they want to do on the project that they can promote themselves to learn and do something about this. Uh, so I encourage all the parents to help their children and also uh, to be involved, to have uh, work together uh, in learning a little more about racial problems. Why, the question is why African Americans are coming out in such a large scale. Why 2020 is just like a repeating history in 1968. And how we can change or making progress for Chinese Americans. Um, so that's the, uh, the end of my talk. Uh, and right now, I want to open up the floor. We're running a little bit late, um, so but I do want to give a chance for audience. Thank you so much, patiently waiting for us to this point. I'd like to open up the floor for anyone who have questions answered who can help you out, or if you want to make a one-minute comment or share your experiences with the rest of the audience, we'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, you can. Uh, you can actually express yourself. If you want to speak, uh, you can actually, if you click on the participant button on Zoom, the participants button will bring out a menu to show you everyone under the Zoom at this now. And you can raise your hand by click the first button, which is raise hand. Once you raise your hand, Ms. Raymond will see you and uh, he can bring you out to speak for a minute. Or if you don't want to speak, that's fine too. You can type your question or your comment in the chat box so people can see your comment and your feeling as well. We'd love to hear from you. Um, but before we open up the floor, actually, I noticed, uh, I just noticed that among our, all of our participants, we have some special guests tonight. And that's uh, our two elected officials in Houston area who are our sort of the, you know, leaders in the Chinese community. I really love to hear from them what they think about what's going on, if they have some parenting advice for what we should do. And so uh, I see uh, Representative Jing Wu here. He is a, the, uh, uh, one of the, we only have two Chinese American representatives in Texas House. So uh, Representative Jing Wu is one of them. And he is um, a second, second generation, right, Jing? Uh, no? <laughs> okay, a first generation, okay. So uh, do you want to speak something about your experience? Um, sure. Um, let me just say this. Uh, you guys have covered a lot, and I've been listening to a lot of it, and it, it's very good. And I, I'm, I'm glad we're starting this conversation because 
even before um, George Floyd, the uh, the issue of race has been uh, a very important to America. And I think the Asian community, the Chinese community, has been pushing this topic, um, as we say, under the rug. Because it's something that's not very comfortable for us to talk about. It's something that we want to pretend that does not exist um, for Chinese Americans. And, you know, that is something that if we ignore it, it will go away. And as we have seen in the last uh, six months, especially with the coronavirus, that the issue of racism against Asian Americans, against Chinese Americans is very real. That we have very old ideas of race about how Asians and Chinese are aliens, that we're strange or we do strange things, that we do strange things that endanger society. All these ideas we thought were long dead are coming back up. And what I think is really important is that the racism does not end with the coronavirus. You guys very briefly touched on the idea of the myth of the model minority. That is a real big problem. I have two young boys that one day I hope that they become great leaders, right? But there's a lot of racism against Chinese that on one side sounds very good, saying that Chinese are so good, they're such good workers. They always work so hard. But the other side of that is they also mean that Chinese, they don't speak up. They don't, they don't say anything when bad things happen. They will just do the work. So what that means for my children is that when they want to be leaders, people go, well, you're Chinese. Are you really a good leader? Can, can Chinese people be good leaders? Because they have the idea that Chinese are just good workers. They're not good at leading. They're not good at speaking. They're not aggressive enough. They're not... They're not um, uh, strong enough. They're just good workers. And these are all very subtle things that our community needs to deal with and needs to work to a better future so our children don't have to fight these same battles that we fought with. You know, um, my, my mother was an engineer in a uh, place where she uh, was one of the only Asians and one of the only women. And she worked there for 25 years and you know, basically was never promoted. And it's these type of things that I think is, is racism against a a Asians. You know, you look at, um, you look at um, the medical center, 30% of the medical staff in the medical center are Asian, but only less than 2% of the administration is Asian. That doesn't seem right. So I hope that we can have this conversation. I hope that we keep pushing. And one of the ways that we move forward is by understanding what other communities, like the African American community, Hispanic community, the Muslim community, understand what they are going through and support them so they will support us. Okay, thank you. I want to add a little bit of thank what you, you so said. Much. I think it's a perfect example of what I just talked about, about model minority, because uh, like you said, it's model minority is, a, I mean, a, well, I want to say is the most a uh, pervasive stereotype for Asian Americans and Chinese Americans in particular. And we suffer and benefit from this at the same time. I think uh, a lot of people uh, think it's a good term because they recognize the positive side, but they don't really think too much about the, the negative side. On the other hand, uh, the African American stereotypes almost the opposite. They can always protest, they can always rock the boat they can right i mean they and they and and people think they they don't work hard and they it's almost the opposite uh so i just want to point that out is is so a lot, of, a lot of time i think it's we can we can learn from that you know like uh, we can speak up when we're 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 having uh, unfair treatment we need to let people know when we're feeling angry or emotional and we can talk about all this with our kids these even when they're little they can start to understand this those are all important things to talk about so i just want to add that thank you Jean. okay thank you jing and i see uh alice chen uh has raised her hand alice chen is actually our city council woman she is a, a chinese american right alice are you the first generation yes, first generation. yes yes 
I want to thank you, Helen, the, uh, Dr. Bai, and uh, um, Dr. J Lee Jean, Dr. Uh, and also Raymond, uh, have this wonderful uh, uh, Zoom meeting tonight. I don't know. I don't know. I don't have. I don't. We are going to. I don't want to spend too much time talk about what we need to do. But I have a, some suggestion to all of you. I read an article several week uh, last week. A letter from Yale student to Chinese American community. Uh, 我上礼拜看了一封信, I was so moved. Her name is Eileen Huang. She's only the junior in Yale University. I don't know if you guys read that uh, story, uh, the letter. But this this, I think this is a civil uh, right movement. We need to work side by side with African American community. If we still keep silent, let's just say this. Let me just give you an example. Imagine if George Ford is Chinese. If Vincent Chen happened this week, this week, Vincent Chen killed by some white guy. Do you think our community will have a protest? to fight for justice. This is a question I want to ask everybody now in this Zoom meeting. If George Ford is a Chinese person, he was killed by the police. If Vincent Chen died this week, do you think we will all be able to protest asking for justice? I don't think this is going to happen. But Eileen Huang and the younger generation, they ask this, they want to do this, they want, but I think the parents, their parents may be against something. They say, oh, don't do it. I mean, there's a problem. And I see a lot of WeChat. There's another uh, student from Harvard University, he, he is a uh, Harvard University. He actually wrote a letter to support Yilin Huang. I hope we can generate more Zoom meeting between the first generation and second generation. We need to work this, we need to work together. We need to make the parents support their kids because they're our future. Those younger generation, Yilin Huang, Zhu Kun, the students sign the yellow, uh, yellow, uh, Yale University. If you watch, if you see the, if you read the letter, there's so many students endorse Eileen Huang's letter. I was so moved. And actually, for the past few days, I tried to reach Eileen Huang to see if I can talk to her to support her because I see some letter, right? Somebody write a nasty letter, a criticize her, which is not fair. We need to support her. We need to do this together. And if I can find Eileen Huang, if I can find the second generation, I really want to give opportunity to do those kids. They am not, I cannot call them kids, younger generation, because we have opportunity in this community. We can make them to work for the, you know, like have internship in Washington, DC. I can make a connection have those kids, have, have those young students have a chance working to the, you know, like for congressman office, for state representative office, like Jean Wu's office, or, or any, uh, any DA office or anything. We have the connection. We can provide opportunity for this, this younger generation. They will, they will have opportunity to speak up for us, for all of us. So I think the conversation between the first generation and the Second generation is critical at this point, and we need to support kids like Eileen Huang. And if, if this long meeting, if you know anybody, anybody, if you know Eileen Huang, please contact me. I really want to talk to her. Eileen Huang, she is a Yale, uh, Yale, Yale University junior. Her major is English, and uh, she lives in New Jersey, and uh, she actually 
is the uh, Asian American Culture Center at Yale. She's one of the uh, leaders. So if any, if you know anybody in Yale University, the kids can find out, uh, you know, Elaine easily. But for me to contact them, I try, I try to get my friend in New Jersey to help me to find out. But no luck so far. So hopefully anybody in this Zoom meeting knows somebody studying Yale University, contact Elaine Huang and contact me. I'm going to give you my email. So please help me. Can somebody help me to find Yiling Huang or Zhu Kun at Harvard University? I love to talk to them. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Alice. Uh, so thank you for speaking on the left side of the parents. I'm sure there are parents who are willing to speak, uh, those parents who speak a little bit different, if you have any different opinions or different view or questions you want to ask, uh, you can certainly talk. Uh, again, you can either post in the chat box your question, or you can raise your hand. If you know how to do that, you click on the participants, uh, bring out all the participants, and click on your first button, which is raise your hand, so we let you speak. Uh, everyone is free to express how you feel about this matter. And uh, uh, I think, uh, Jing, you are going to read uh, the question. Are there any questions that we can answer at this point? 有一个问题我问得很好 uh, The question was written in Chinese So I'm going to answer in Chinese uh, um, uh, uh, Because I think I want to answer to that parent Okay, so yeah uh, the question first? He said that this is a big deal The majority of the young people Okay, 第一个呢，家长和孩子是different generations，对不对？有没有generation gap？呃，因为家长的年纪比较大，然后他呃会有一些因为年纪的原因有一些不同的想法。呃，年轻人一般都是比较激进一点，然后呢思想比较活跃，然后有很多思想很容易被别人influence，good way or bad way。然后呢？ 家长的思想处相对比较固定化，然后呢，会有一个比较已经成型的世界观和价值观，基本上不太容易被别人影响。还有一个很大的原因就是，呃，家长和孩子是有 parents and kids have very different immigration status, have very different uh background, social background of growing up. 第一。第一代的华人家长是在中国大陆长大
那时候的社会环境其实是相对公平的，我想说。呃，尤其是在那种环境下，城城里的孩子呃上学，然后长大，是一个比较，我用用英文的说法是 leveled field， OK， 大家都差不多穷，基本上资源都差不多。我打个岔好不好？ OK， 我打个岔好不好？ OK， 因为我想，父母跟子女有差异，就跟人跟人间有差异，一点都不奇怪。问题是。我们若有认定的什么是对，什么是错，而使得我们跟子女没有办法交流的话，那就是个问题。所以问题不是为什么有 gap， 而是问题有了 gap 中之间，我们还有没有 communication？ That's the question we have to ask ourselves。若我们已经心里面已经有了什么是对，什么是错，小孩子该做什么事情的话，那对不起，小孩子跟你只会越离越远。对我同意。所以我想不需要说那么长了。我们有很多人在等这样问的问题。对不起，我打你的岔了。<笑> yeah, so yeah, I, if I... 我的观点是一样的。我认为，就第一步是你要你要认识到，你要认识到，就是说这有两个 gap 在那里。OK， 一般人只有一个 gap， generation gap， 但是我们有 immigration gap。OK， 所以我们的我想我们有不止两个 gap。对不起，再打你的岔。OK， <笑> more than two maybe I don't know。是，我想有很多人在等着回答。我们这些主讲人就少说一点吧。OK， 呃，所以我的意思是说，有这些 gap 不说也不奇怪，呃，所以但是呢，我同意白教授说的意思是说，你你，如有有分歧，然后你意识到这分歧就会很很差，但而且这是这是从我们的背景来的，所以所以可以理解到会有分歧，但是呢，我想说的是，很多时候你家作为家长，也许需要像我的历史老师一样，不要提供一个 answer， 然后呢。但是呢，同样的，孩子们他们需要知道这个 racist 和 racism are very strong words. You are not supposed to pass those words very easily to your parents. OK， 我认为，尤其是华人家庭很多是其实是没有什么 middle class。我们其实根本还 we're not reaching to the glass ceiling. We're not even in the practice of all that. 你可以说 OK， 我觉得你的想法有点 prejudice. OK。我觉得你有有有一些 stereotypes， 但是我我我我觉得上升到 racism to me is a little bit too strong. OK. Yeah, Tina, Tina, Miao, you want to ask the question, is it? Ah, do we? Yeah, do we have other questions? If we can help to answer, and uh, and also, if if you have really uh went through my talk, you probably know that we have so much subtle. It's called implicit bias. In sociology, there's another term called implicit bias. 就是在我们心中隐形的这个偏见和成见。Ah, so implicit bias really make us behave in certain ways. Also, it's very difficult to see because they're invisible. So your children grow up in the U.S., they will have their views. What, like Dr. Pei said, it is very natural and it's it's okay. You know, you and me can feel different and see things differently. But the problem is how we become attached to our views, and attachment is the problem. So if you, uh, in my slide, uh, I provide you a a resource on psychology today about attachment and detachment. So as children, uh, remember I always remember this view: how a baby is born with our、uh, the mother's cord wrap around the neck, right? The baby would die if. That cord is not cut off, and this is exactly the way how we treat our adult children. If you're going to use your cord, which your which is your belief structure, your perception framework, to wrap around the neck of your child, and not let them breathe or explore their world, guess what happened? They will just die like that fetus of that like that baby being born. Because they don't have space to grow themselves or develop their own life experience, so、um, you know. In terms of me, I always in, enjoy learning from my children. I see my children as my teacher.、Um, so we learn together, and this is why I said it's a community of learning together.、Uh, so、uh, that, that I just want to throw up my words there. But、uh, Helen, there's a couple of people who want to raise their hand on the speech. Okay. Yeah. So it look like we have.、Uh, you you want to pass them to speak then? Yeah. How do I do that? Just click the hand. Okay. So I I see.、Um, uh, I see. Hi, Pinny. 
Uh, this is Jin yes. Ping. Hello. Can you hear me? No. Okay. Uh, uh, this is this is a Hai Ping Ni. Um, uh, I'm the f uh, first generation parent, and uh, of course I've been here for 20 years. And I uh, graduated from Rice University with an MBA uh, degree. And um, uh, another 150 years, I might catch up with uh, Raymond's family with a legacy. But the, I, I want to share with you guys, there's a observation that I have uh, in the Asian communities, the parents that I talk to. I think a majority of the parents are, you know, very, um, you know, understanding and they are very tolerant to their kids. Uh, the opinions. And I think they share the different opinions, but mainly relating to, okay, they, everybody that I talk to condemn this event, the death of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, this gentleman and uh, in Minneapolis. But I think the different opinion, but for many parents are the label of racism easily putting on, um, you know, the police officers that, uh, and you know, everywhere, not only in Minneapolis, but the whole community. So I think that there's a difference that, uh, you know, different of the observations, new generation have their opinions, they're learning from the, uh, their experiences, that's to be respected. However, I think that parents and the first generation, no matter you call it first generation, second generation, I usually do not put that label on that because I talk to each generation, they have the different opinion all over the place. So that I would like to say, say that as, as a parent, for me, I listen and I also share with uh, my kid about my uh, experiences and the, the, where my opinion was from and I hear from them uh, what they are thinking. So, but I, I, I would rather not to put a label on a certain generation or certain people on what they're thinking. Okay, thank you so much for sharing that. That's very helpful. Uh, I believe uh, we have Tina Mel. She, she wants to speak, right, Tina? You want to talk about your view? I chat with her. She just applaud your comment, should I say? Oh, okay. Hi, uh, this Tina. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I have been here only for six years, uh, but about the children's education about for the discrimination and I want to share one thing with everyone here uh, through my own experience. I joined the Bible study and uh, there is a, a second generation Chinese American. She's a lady and uh, she, you know, she, in the beginning, I don't know why she didn't like me, like my family, you know, my, my, my husband and me, my two children, we are Chinese. And um, she, she always um, talked to me, hi, Tina, this is my country, and you are Chinese, you're from China, something like that. So, you know, I'm interested in why she always talked to me, talk, talk to me in this way. And I, finally, I, um, I noticed the two things. Um, in, in this Bible study, only us, only my family, we are original from China and only being here. We are, we are uh, freshmen, newcomers. And uh, the left four families, they're uh, second generation Asian Americans or they are uh, Caucasian or they are uh, Korean, Korean Americans. So I remember the, um, when she said, hi, this is my country and you are Chinese, something like that. And uh, oh, everyone, say nothing. But one day she left and once she left another family, the lady said, hi, Tina, I cannot understand. She is a Chinese. Why she said those so ne negative things in front of you. So, you know, um, when I heard that lady said that those things in front of me. I, I just realized no matter how many generations you are, first generation, second generation, even though you are totally native speaker, but as, as long as you have an Asian face, you always be treated as a Chinese or as an American. 
So, um, so after I realized, I think I, I don't want my children lost that, their identity. So I told my, I always told, teach my children, please be proud of your parents from China, original from China, they're Chinese. And we have lots of beautiful, wonderful culture thousands of years ago. So I don't want to my children feel like ashamed or like guilty to be a Chinese. So I always teach my children, hey, you are Chinese, your parents you are, Ch uh, are from China, Chinese. Even though you guys were born and grew up here, maybe one day you cannot speak Chinese. But remember, as long as you have the Asian face, you will be labeled as Chinese forever. So you should be proud of your Chinese identity. Uh. So okay. Thank you so, so much I, for that I, I, think, I, I think I want to say something because this is so typical. This is, uh, this is almost something like a textbook example uh, in, in my sociology <laughs> study. This is a perpetual foreigner uh, stereotype, typical textbook, okay? No matter how many generations you are and you are a foreigner, and this is bad. I'm so sad to see the second generation Chinese American also have this view. And um, they're, they're, they're the victims, okay? They are actually the victims of the stereotype as well, just like you are, okay? Uh, so um, I, I don't know what to say, but uh, uh, it also basically says, you know, your Chinese or Korean or whatever the Asian is, is the opposite of Americanness, which is not true, okay? So I support you, Tina. Well, let me comment. Very soon, Caucasian will not a majority in this country. So I think the difference is here, if the white feels the superiority over the Asian, that is the problem we have. But things are changing. I see many second generation, they don't feel that way. They really embraced the whole America. That's how my daughter responded. He questioned me, it's not how much I felt about Asian America. It's really felt, how do we feel about other minority groups? Then we will just become one of the minority. I think that's the process we have to go through. And that's what Jim was saying earlier, that's the struggle we have to go through. I think it's changing. Talk about my personal experience. When I came here, I was so happy, I want to I go through the technical ladder. In seven years, staff and postdoc, I became a department head. At Bell Lab, I was one level below the highest ranked Chinese American in Bell Lab. So I think that's the problem we faced at that time. We came a long way. Things change in two fronts. Center of the glass ceiling was removed. One is the civil rights movement. The other reason was the normalization of relationship with China. When the China status rises, not just the status of us in here rise, but also because of job opening. More companies want to do business with China, just promotional paths opening up. So the warming side is that path is closing up now. Okay, so when the, China, the connection with China is no longer the desired connection for the American corporate, the promotion chance for the Chinese American will reduce. Whether you will go back to where we were in the 70s or 60s, I don't know. But I think the challenge we're going to face in, in the next 10 years. So be prepared. Okay, so actually we're running out of the, uh, over time, and I hope we can continue this discussion in future. I see some of the comments about, uh, you know, we, we need to continue to have this dialogue, especially between parents and children, and I think that's very, very true. So hopefully we can host similar events in the future. I saw the, uh, one more hand raised, and I hope we can make the last comment, and we can end today. And Ms. Uh, or Mr. Fang Yuanyuan, yeah. So Yuanyuan. Yes. Oh, hello. Can you guys hear me? 
Yeah, so we can hear you. Okay, great, great. Because my computer just lost power. So I just okay. Go yeah, go ahead. Phone. Yes. So I have two points to make. First, um, I want to be, I'm first generation uh, Chinese. Uh, I studied sociology for seven years in China, uh, four years a bachelor degree, three years in sociology, uh, master degree. And I came to the to, uh, US and I studied social work for two years. And I work as a social worker for eight, nine years in the US. So from my point of, for, from my experience, I noticed that when I, re, when I read articles written by the second generation and the first generation parents, I noticed that um, us, the fir many first generation immigrants, do not have, do not understand some concepts. So I really appreciate what Dr. Lee um, shared with us about what the definition or what, it's, uh, what it means you know, by racism, by uh, stereotypes, by prejudice by um, uh, 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 some other concepts and also um, privilege. I wanted her to talk about privilege. And be because people don't have the same understanding of those concepts, that's why it became a, 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 a backlog. It became a, a barrier for communication between the children and the parents. Um, and secondly, um, I kind of lost my thought. Second point, I wanted to make um, that we parents, you know, I have a young son. My son is only five years old. So I haven't really had a lot of opportunity to talk to him about racism yet. But I feel that as first generation uh, parents, we should make a deliberate effort to educate ourselves. Of course, we can share with our children. Our experience is difficult. It's difficult for us immigrants to come here, start, you know, from nothing. Um, but it is also important for us to make deliver, uh, deliberate effort to learn about American history, learn about the history of other minorities, or, you know, uh, which relates to how our children will experience how, you know, in this country. And my uh, suggestion for the parents is that grow with your child. Like I, you know, I, you know, my child, as I said, my child is uh, still very young, but I, 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 uh, what I did was, um, you know, I borrow books for him, you know, when it's Asian American month, I borrowed Asian American theme books. When it was uh, Black History Month in February this year, I borrowed, um, you know, uh, Black History theme books, you know, recommended by, by the library, by the teachers you know, or from the book recommendation list. And I learned history. I learned uh, from those children's books myself as well. And uh, one book is called uh, Black is a, is a Rainbow Color. I read it. I felt deeply moved by how um, the book tried to educate why Black is beautiful. Because in many people's mind, even in, in, in Chinese culture, darkness is not beautiful. So it's, I mean, so I just want to share with everyone that it's important to be open-minded and grow with our children so we can understand each other better and communicate better when they become teenagers. That's all. I, I really like the comment because uh, I felt the same way too. Uh, as I mentioned, when we were in China, the, the way we learn history is completely different. You know, all we remember is the years and the name of the people, we were never encouraged to really to reflect upon history and how it impacts our today's life. So when I look at my daughter and when they were in middle school, I, I read all of their uh, social study, actually, I'm learning with them together. And I realized, oh my goodness, the history is taught completely different. I love social science and I learned a lot of things with my daughter. <laughs> And as I said, that's why I, I, have, uh, I have this recommended book list because when they read, I want to read with them too and to see what they're learning. <laughs> uh, yes. Like, like uh, Yuan Yuan just said, you know, because the lack of vocabulary, you know, the first thing we, we need to even to learn is the vocabulary people are using, the children are using, right? Otherwise, we'll be forever perpetual foreigners in this country because we don't even know what people are, how they think or what language they're using. So I lo love that comment too. Um, because uh, I, of, uh, we're almost at 10 o'clock. Yeah, yeah, I want to add one comment. Yeah, okay. When I was raised in LA, Los Angeles, the American history was so whitewashed. The Indians were evil. The blacks, the Negroes were evil. 
that was what I was being, being bombarded. I was whitewashed. So I just want to let you know, you have to do your own study, your own experience, your own reading, and learn from that experience. Yeah, exactly. And actually, one of the books that are on the uh, bestseller list is uh, What Your History Teacher Has Taught You Wrong, something like that to the title. I'll share with everyone in an email or something. Uh, so just Google that book, uh, or the, uh, what, what Your teacher have, uh, History Teacher Has Taught You is Wrong. And because our history book, in fact, we're still fighting this in Texas, our history book was written you know, in favor of the white supremacists and the suppress of the minorities. And this is very clear, uh, for example, to Native American history, uh, to the Asian uh, American history, we, we all know this for a fact. So I hope our younger generation will have a louder voice and fight for our rights when they grow up, or even now. Uh, so I really want to thank everyone to participate tonight. It's 10 o'clock. Uh, we have this you know, sort of a little bit over time, but we hope again and everyone continue to have this dialogue and really to help our community to move together instead of keep on fighting with each other. You know, when we left and right fight with each other, when children and parents fight with each other, it is the loss of our community because our community does not have voice together and that is a major problem. So um, again, uh, Thank, want to thank everyone who spent the time with us and uh, have a good night and we continue to have this dialogue in the future. Thank you so much and uh, thank you everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, again, if you have more comments and more thoughts, you can continue to uh, send to us and we'll try to answer as much as we could. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a, have a good night. Enjoy yourself. Hey, what's the next next meeting? <laughs> uh, when is next meeting? Well, we, we'll ask <laughs> we'll ask people if they really enjoy this kind of a conversation. What we'll, we'll arrange the next one? I, I know our next talk. Uh, UCA is uh, actually arranging our next section, which is a dialogue between parents and children. So if you have children, or if you have other parents interested to this type of session, what we'll, we'll, uh, this has already been arranged. You can invite them to talk and, and speak in those sessions too. Yeah. There's a discussion at the national level is coordinating with the, the Chinese school association. Yeah, the Chinese school association. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. I like the candlelight. Uh, I'm going to.